Hey folks, Kiltman here. Kiltman at your services. How are you all? I hope we're all doing very, very well. Now, do you want to see Count Dracula? Yes, the bloodsucker Supremo. Do you want to see him as a lovesick puppy? Do you? Do you really? Well, Luc Besson, visionary, stylish filmmaker, may grant you your wish. Because his next movie project is Dracula. And some sources say it's called Dracula hyphen a love tale. Oh. oh no, what are they doing? What are they doing again? Why, why, why? And it's gonna be an origin story. The young Count Vlad Tepes of Wallachia, defending his sovereign territory against the Turks, presumably. Uh, and his love for his, his wife, his young, early life, this is, and how it all turns horribly wrong when she is killed and he then turns against God and Christianity and becomes vampire. We've seen it all before, haven't we? It's not exactly new. Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know, way back in the early 90s, did this story. And that tried to make itself out to be the most authentic, faithful telling of Bram Stoker's Dracula, written in the 1890s. And uh, an absolute classic masterpiece of gothic horror it is. I've discussed it a gazillion times on the channel. However, Bram Stoker did not base his Dracula on Vlad Tepes. And Mina wasn't a reincarnation of his former love. He was a a horrible, dastardly, evil, blood-sucking, undeadster. That's what he was. He may have been a nobleman at one point, but now he's a, he's a heart-barren, despicable, rodent-type creature. Yes, in command of all the lower life forms, as we know, and can change into any one of them at any time. You know, well, except during the sun, the sunrise and all that daytime stuff. But uh, it's been done before. Luke Evans did Dracula the Untold Story in that really ill-fainted you know, universal, you know, dark universe revival thing, which was a complete disaster. Now, I saw Dracula the Untold Story and I can't remember a friggin' thing about it. I really, really can't. And I bet Luke Evans likes to forget about it as well. It didn't do well. But it told a sort of similar story, I, I, I think it did anyway, the early life of Dracula. And this, from Luc Besson, appears to be doing the same thing. There's not a lot of details known about this, although the story has been mooted around for the last, I think, few years, and Luc Besson's finally become attached to it as director. Uh, I don't know if he's writing it as well. I don't know if typical composer Eric Serra is doing the uh, the score for it. Uh, folks, there's nothing wrong with telling Dracula stories again and again and again. He's one of those archetypes. He's been around since the book came out. There were theatrical productions. So he's been on stage. And then, of course, Nosferatu. Frederick, Frederick Wilhelm Merno. Well, I stumbled over that one there, didn't I? 1922's absolute masterpiece of horror, a symphony of terror, Nosferatu, Max Schreck as Count Graf Orlok, the unofficial Dracula, but it's Dracula. And from that point onwards, we had Universal with Bela Lugosi, we had Hammer with Christopher Lee, we've had numerous versions, Louis Jordan, Frank Langella, so many, Gary Oldman, of course, Leslie Nielsen, Dracula, dead and loving it. It's been done to death, and in fact, undeath. And it always will be. There's room for more tellings of Dracula stories. Of course there are. And the most obvious thing to do, to be slightly different, although as we've discovered, it's been done before, the Francis Ford Coppola's version of Dracula, and the Luke Evans version. The, the origin story. Where did he come from? How did he become a vampire? Now that, actually in itself, could be quite interesting. But it's this... It's a love tale. Oh dear God. If you're gonna base it in any way, shape or form on Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, 
Vlad Dracul, as, his, as he was known, the Order of the Dragon. I mean, all these elements which uh, Francis Ford Coppola put into his movie are true in historical fact, but Bram Stoker didn't use any of them. No. In fact, there's a lot of cases for arguing that he used more the likes of uh, Countess Elizabeth Bathory, Countess Strachan, who bathed in the blood of virgins and all that to keep herself young and did other horrible things as well. He, he was very interested in that legend as well. And also Sheridan Le Fanu's uh, Camilla, which spawned some great Hammer movies, as we all know and love and revere. Very big chesticle celebrating movies, yeah. But uh, he did not base much on Vlad the Impaler. So where they're getting this stuff from is kind of like you're shoehorning that in. So you're trying to create the, the real story of Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Tepes, and his, his valiant crusade to save Transylvania, well, Valachia. Um, and then twist it into the legend of Count Dracula. But this whole love lorn thing, lost his love and then turns his back on Christ. Oh dear, I don't know. Right, let's see who's in it. Wrote this down, because I did not know the guy. Although, you but you guys might. Caleb Landry Jones, who was in Luke Besson's previous movie, Dogman, a festival circuit favorite. Uh, I've not seen it, but it's a, a tale, a weird tale of a guy that's been abused as a child by his father and then Seth gets flung to the dogs but the dogs look after him and protect him and he becomes Dogman. No, not a kind of superhero, not like that at all. It's told in sort of flashback fashion about his life. He's been arrested, you see. Uh, but weird stuff. But Caleb Landry Jones was also in Get Out and uh, a few other things and is quite a celebrated indie sort of um, actor. He's going to be playing Dracula. Okay, well, he's young enough, yeah. So, I mean, the young Dracula, yeah, you want someone like that who's perhaps a bit indie vibes about him, sort of unorthodox, uh, a bit sort of gothic, brooding, rom new romantic. And I don't mind that sort of quality at all. That could work. But uh, speaking of new romantics, oh my God. Do you remember um, in Van Helsing, the Hugh Jackman version, you had Richard Roxburgh as, uh, as Dracula with the pure, the pure new romantic look with his hair doing all that. Like, <laughs> So that even that's been done before. Uh, you've got Christoph Waltz. Christoph Waltz. Or Waltz, if you're in the UK. Because we don't care about how you pronounce your W's and all that. A great actor. Wonderful in everything except Bond, where he was the utterly ridiculous and unnecessary, unwanted Blofeld. Awful, awful, awful. But he is a great actor. Now, they haven't said who he's playing. And... When I first read this, which was only this morning, because the news only broke this morning, I thought, oh, he's going to be playing um, Van Helsing. But he won't be, will he? If it's set in the past, in the 15th century, he's not playing Van Helsing. Or is he the great, 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 great granddaddy of Van Helsing? Mm, who knows? People on the inside have read the screenplay. Again, I'm, I can't testify that who... I don't know who's written the screenplay. It could be best on himself. I don't know. He has written scripts. He does do that. Um, but I don't know if it's his name yeah, at the top of that script. Uh, I've said it contains epic and spectacular set pieces. Battles, presumably. Battles. Gotta be. Uh, now, again, the Luke Evans thing did have battles in it. Uh, Coppola's version had a very abstract sort of battle at the start of it with puppetry and very sort of antiquated vintage special effects, which I do love and applaud. Uh, but oh, I don't know. I'm still I'm still torn. Do you want your warrior warlord to then become the vampire? How is it going to be told? Is it going to be to, like all the early romances and all that with his wife? Uh, Justina was his, uh, his real wife. Uh, Elisabetta, of course, in Coppola's version. You're hearing um, Vicek Kilar's awesome score for Bram Stoker's track in it here right now. 
Oh, by the way, cheers, y'all. Mm. It's whiskey, because I never drink wine. Uh, best on the stone, historical before. Forget about all his sort of, you know, his modern day neo sort of hyper stylish modern thrillers and stuff and his futuristic dramas like Valerian and, and whatever the hell that title was and The Fifth Element. If he's done The Mes Messenger, which was uh, the story of Joan of Arc with his then wife, uh, Mila Hohovic, playing Joan of Arc. Now that had great big battle scenes and was an epic movie. Eric Serra did the score for that. I, I'm not a fan of Eric Serra at all. I really am not. The worst Bond score by far was his for Gold Knight. Truly diabolical. But he actually ditched the synthesizer and used the full orchestra for The Messenger. So, and it worked. Now, I like The Messenger. Again, it's a long time since I've seen it, but I know that he commanded quite a good use of a large you know, cast, lots of extras and locations and battle scenes. And he did it pretty well. So that sort of thing, this, where it says epic and spectacular set pieces, I think he could definitely pull that off, obviously. And if he's going to use Eric Serrat again, I would urge Serrat to go full orchestral, fully symphonic. Or if you want to, use the theremin. You could do that. We had Dario Argento's Dracula 3D. Oh, yes, we did. Anyone remember that? God, how the mighty fall, hey. Uh, Thomas Kretschmann as Dracula and Rutger Hauer as Van Helsing. <laughs> it's, oh, it, sometimes I, I kind of want to love it because it's so OTT and it's very gory. Uh, the 3D is, yeah, it's reasonable. It's actually actually pretty well done. Um, but it, it's such a lousy film, so stupidly told. And Argento's direction is all over the show. But you've got the great Claudio Simonetti from Goblin does the score for it. And he uses the theremin and lots of electronica, but in all a kind of ethereal, weird sort of way. And I do like the score for it a lot. So what I'm saying is like, Eric Serra, if, you, if you're watching, <laughs> um, gothic, brooding, yeah. Uh, epic canvas, if you've got big battles and you're telling a story over maybe a good few years perhaps if you've got campaigns and then the loss of the loved one and the becoming a vampire and then hopefully you get a bit of vampirism as well hopefully we're going to get that although i ain't so certain to be honest dracula a love tale um, this dracula sucks no i don't know um but as i said before we've had dracula from got hundreds of filmmakers, loads of different studios, loads of different interpretations, and he is a character that will, from the dawn of people acting on stage, well, once the book was written, I mean, once the book was written, and then it was on stage, then it was in talkies, silence, then talkies, then, you know, 3D, and it's been in every format known to man, reworked, reimagined, retweaked. Nicolas Cage played Dracula last year in Renfield. And, and the weird thing about that was, I reviewed that movie. Well, that wasn't so weird, but the weird thing about the movie is that Nicolas Cage, the most OTT, uh, avant-garde, expressionistic, wild, crazy, zany performer, actually reined it back in when he really could have gone OTT with the character. I still liked his performance. It, it was manic, but it, it had dropped down the, the Cage-Richter scale. So, you know... He's been with us, Dracula has been with us for all of our lives. And the point I'm making is he's going to go beyond. He's undead. He lives forever. Of course he does. Even when he gets staked, you know, he comes back again in the next Hammer movie. He, someone, or someone stupidly revives him every bloody time, don't they? They never learn the lesson, do they? But he'll keep on reappearing. So it seems kind of inane and redundant to start going, oh God, another Dracula movie. Oh, what's this? Another origin story. Why is it always going to be origins? You're going to get this and you're going to get it again as well. It's going to happen. Resign yourself to the fact that this is coming and there'll be other ones to follow. I mean, we still haven't had the full, authentically faithful 
to Bram Stoker's prose version in film, yes. That, no, no, Coppola's version isn't, it isn't. Or it might draft in some characters who are often neglected, and it might bring in some little bits which weren't there beforehand, but in, in cinematic versions. But still, if it adds all this, and that wasn't Bram Stoker, for God's sake. And, you know, there's Spanish versions, there's French versions, there's Italian versions, there's all sorts of versions of it. But none really actually capture the essence of Bram Stoker's um, work. I'm not the biggest fan of Bram Stoker's novel. I've read it. I enjoy it. Well, I always... I've, I've tried to read it several times. I have read the whole thing, but never in one proper sitting. Because that whole sort of, it's journals, it's diaries, it's note entries and letters. I hate that. And although that leads any film interpretation to have set pieces like that, and to be told from different viewpoints, which can be quite a, a novel, hey, a novel approach to filmmaking, a film story narrative, it's not easy to do, and it can throw you off. You like to have your central couple of characters and a, and a few supporting ones. You know, your protagonist and you've got your antagonists. And that's how you, you like to have it play out. To have all, to actually do Bram Stoker's novel and put it on film would actually be quite an unwieldy and maybe awkward thing to watch. So I can see why it doesn't happen. We haven't had that fully authentic version. So it leaves itself open to all of these different interpretations and you're gonna get a million, a million and one more. So, hey, get used to it. But who knows? I want horror. I want Dracula to be a horror story. He's a repellent, horrible thing in Bram Stoker's prose. You make him a romantic, tragic hero and you've lost all the horror. But depending on how it's done, you can understand why he changes. Gary Oldman's portrayal, I love it, but I think it's flawed. Not because of his performance, but because of the way it's written. Like, you know, the reincarnation of Elizabeth. You know, it, it, it's shit and tawdry and all, all too lovelorn and romantic and very Byron-esque. That's not what Stoker wrote. I don't mind having a Dracula who is in love and everything's happy. He's happy fighting Turks and impaling them. And also having his lunch while their entrails spill down the spike that he'd been, been, been impaled on. And all the other tortures that he did. He did, a, he did a lot more than just impaling. He did a lot more than that. He's a right nasty bastard. But he still finds time for love. So he's in love with his wife and everything's going great. And then she will die and he will be enraged. Now hopefully that'll be like sort of the halfway point in the movie. <laughs> and, uh, and then it like, turns his back on Christ and the church and everything. And like, I'm never never certain how that itself transforms you into a vampire. In Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Coppola version, you know, you, you just, what do you do? You just renounce God and, drink, and suddenly a great big stone crucifix starts bleeding and then you fill the goblet with that and drink the blood well aren't you drinking the blood of christ and isn't that what you're meant to be how does that turn you into a vampire it doesn't you know then again you could always say that, well that's part of the mystery you don't really understand how it happened it must have been more because it's told in a very sort of lyrical um very ott highly stylized fashion Besson's version, I would hope, would actually really anchor down how he becomes a vampire. The Luke Evans one was no, was no better in that in that respect either, from what I can remember. But you want to know how this happened, the transition, the pact he's made, what has he done? Has someone else put the bite on him? Has he put himself out there? Like, look, I've lost my wife now. I turn me back on Christ. Just up. Oh, Someone bite me, bite me. I want to be a vampire. Could go horribly wrong and just get AIDS or rabies. <laughs> Cheers, y'all. Mm. So this is going to come, but it's not going to be this year. I mean, they haven't even begun making it. We've only, there's just two cast, cast names that we know of. 
We don't know who's doing the effects. We don't know what kind of effects they're going to be. Are they going to be CG? Are they going to be practical effects? A combination of both? I would presume a combination of both. And hopefully with real location work as well. Real castles, real forests, real ravines and canyons and mountains. A cast of a huge amount of extras for big battle sequences. It can be done. Of course it can be done. He's a, Luke Besson's a big name, you know. He still commands quite a lot of clout. Yes, there was a... Um, yeah, the, the charges filed against him for sexual misconduct, and uh, but they were all dropped, so there's, there's no there's no stigma attached to him now, presumably. So he can command whatever he wants, and he's already got well. The two the two names so far are two interesting um, character actors, so that could work in its favour, obviously. Um, he's got a bit of shuts part with historical epics with the messenger, so that could work as well. Um, so I wish him well. <laughs> There's nothing more I can add to it really, it's just that Dracula, yeah, I woke up this morning and like, oh, a new Dracula film, I was like, oh, you're kidding. Well, who's having a go at this time? And Luke Besson, I, I, that was the big surprise. I thought, what the hell? What? You do like just modern madcap adventures and sort of a super zany avant-garde sci-fi. The fifth element. Oh dear God. Yeah, it looked great, didn't it? Didn't it look great? But uh, oh sweet Jesus, it was just, I'm not gonna go into it. It, it actually traumatized me. And yeah, once we got to that big sort of cruise ship space station thing and a certain character came into it with a certain Afro dildo on front of his, front of his head. Yeah, that was it. I was, I was out. Forget it. And Gary Oldman was in there as well. <laughs> and the great Brian James was in there. Yeah, there's Bruce Willis and Mila Hovich again. Like, and Ian Holm was in there too. And they could tell they were having a bit of fun doing it, but oh dear lord, I don't know. It didn't work for me. But I'm willing to. I don't mind this happening. I want to be able to talk about it as we as more news breaks as you know oh my god they're filming here they're doing this they've now cast so and so and oh and rumor has it we're going down this direction there's going to be transgender and there's going to be all this i hope he doesn't do any of that don't pander to woke agendas please don't do that luke don't do it don't do it man but another dracula movie and we've got another Nosferatu movie coming at the start of next year. The very start, January the 1st in the UK. We have Robert Eggers', Robert Eggers' version of Nosferatu, which is his adaptation of the original F.W. Merno Nosferatu from 1922. And uh, wow, the poster artwork that I've seen and some of the imagery I've seen, yeah, wow, looks right up my street, right in my crypt, you know? Right, so folks, there you go. Uh, there's more coming later on today, but I thought I'd mention this before people start bombarding me, which they do. There's another Dracula film coming out. Have you seen this? And I, oh, yeah, I have. So folks, in the meantime, this ever endlessly blood-sucking in-between time, please keep it chaotic, keep it chaotic, and I'm gonna see you all Whoa, I've got a croak in that one there, didn't I? That's a bit of blood clotted down the throat from a little bite I had before. Hi!